everyone and thank you for logging on to watch another edition of the ministry journey today i'm talking to the karen allen she's hey everyone of place of dreams she's also a speaker a teacher an author and she's a mother of five and she's an amazing woman and before i came online she kind of gave me a telling off but because i'm i'm older than her but because i'm humble I <laughs> you, took you are all in i took no, i love you boss she was talking truth welcome karen i'm really excited to interview you likewise we try i tried to set this up before but it it didn't come the timing up, god yeah. knows everything works in God's timing. That's what I believe anyway. Absolutely, so, I agree. I'm really li- I'm really interested to hear your journey, especially as I've experienced your ministry myself before, because we've mm-hmm. spoken at a couple of my events. We used to go to yes. the same church. I know people are most probably thinking she only interviews her friends, she only interviews her <laughs> Do your but thing. I have to explain before I start the questioning. I was a um, reporter at The Voice newspaper and I was editor of a faith-based magazine called Keep the Faith. So I was meeting everybody. I had to connect with everybody in order mm. to get my story. So if ma- there's very few people that I don't know or I don't know of and that's because of my work. So I just thought I'd clear that up. But anyway, going straight into the questions. Karen. Yes. When did you get called into ministry because your ministry is broad and how did you go about preparing um, to be in ministry well first of all thanks for having me Mars. it's a privilege to be on considering that you know the world and i got chosen i'm ch- i feel blessed to be chosen um and to all your listeners and viewers god bless you um i got called into i got saved at the age of 20 and i can honestly say that i got called to the ministry at um in my early 20s However, I didn't start operating in ministry till much later. So this, the particular ministry that you mentioned, the place of dreams, that was, yeah, that calling came later on in my walk with the Lord. But in terms of being called as a ministry leader or a ministry head, I would say round about the age 23, 22, 23, probably two years after I got saved, I had, a, I had an open vision and the Lord showed me in a vision that he had called me to speak. And he literally said that your ministry is in your mouth. Now, you would have to understand that as a younger teenager in my late teens, even throughout my teenage years, to, to if anyone had told Karen at school that she would be speaking as part of her life, she would have just told them to just lay off the smoke and the, the drink because it wasn't who I was in terms of, you know, some people, they love to talk anywhere. They're outgoing. My natural default personality people roll their eyes when I say this is I am an introvert I do not like the limelight I do not like to be up front so when I had that vision of me being on stage up front my first reaction was binding the devil Um, but it became very evident quite quickly that this was the direction that God was leading me with leading me in and to be honest with you in terms of preparation it started with the basics, which I'm sure many of your guests have mentioned, prayer and fasting. It, it start, well, after the fear, you know, it was literally praying, fasting and really diving into God's word. This was a huge element of me preparing for ministry because I was saved in a ministry where at a time where women were not up front. So it was very heavily male dominated in terms of being up front, speaking, preaching, teaching, etc. So I really had to search the scriptures and um, to to find evidence, so to speak, of what I believed God was calling me to do. So um, those are the ways in which I prepared, to be honest, for the ministry that I was called to. OK, let me ask a question just in relation to the church we were both in, which was Christian mm-hmm. Life City, which was led by Bishop Wayne Malcolm. Did you actually mm-hmm. work in the ministry at all? So you may not have been up front preaching, which is what you do now, but yes. were the things you're doing in the background, like sort of like mm-hmm. ordering, doing the services, you know, um, mm-hmm. moderating, etc. Yeah, to be honest, Marcia, I don't think there's anything I did not do. I think the only thing I didn't do, which even as I'm saying it, I actually did do a couple of times, was work on the sound. 
but I oh, did right. definitely okay. do that a couple of times. So I did everything from ushering to um, the young people, the Sunday school to the youth um, administration. I was Bishop Malcolm's personal assistant for eight years. So I did all the background work in terms of, you know, preparing ministry, preparing, goodness me, preaching notes to organizing ministry heads, leadership training. Yeah, so behind the scenes, that's where, that's where I grafted behind the scenes. That's what I was happy behind the scenes. Like that was, if God had said, this is where you're gonna be for the rest of your life, I'd have done backflips. Because administration actually is one of my primary gifts. Okay, well, I always say that the most powerful person in a church behind the pastor is the church administrator. 100%, 100, 100%. So, 100%. Okay, so, so you, I, would, you would have met everybody, touched base absolutely. with everybody, knew what was going on. So absolutely. Ministering in proxy anyway. Absolutely. Know. Correct, yeah. So how would, I've just, I gave a description of your ministry, but how would you um, describe your ministry? Yeah, I, I, I would now. describe my, I would describe my ministry as one that doesn't fit. And what I mean by that is, is, um, is very, I don't know if unorthodox is the right word for the for the English teachers that might be watching, but my I describe my ministry as an aeroplane, okay? And the, the, an aeroplane needs two wings in order for it to fly and for it to be balanced. So my ministry really has two elements to it. It has, and when I say even using the word ministry, I usually use the word mission. So my mission has two elements to it. It has a ministry side, which is the spiritual empowerment side, and it has a marketplace side, which is the personal development side. So I, I use these two elements to feed into the mission that God has called me to. So what we're specifically talking about, I'm assuming, is what I call my ministry side, which is the spiritual empowerment side of the plane that I am flying. OK, so when it comes to churches, you know, speaking at conferences and spiritual events, um i more i will lean into this side of my mission however i do a very similar thing in schools colleges um young offenders institutes that is my personal development side now what a lot of people don't know i actually said this to someone recently is that i will often take the exact same content that i use over here in ministry and use it over here in my in my personal development mish marketplace side but just take the bible out just take the bible references out so i'll use exactly the same principles but i present it in a way that is palatable for the audience that i'm using it for so my mis my ministry is very because again I, I usually call it my mission is is not as square i would say as a lot of people that you may interview or may not to be honest i haven't watched all of your podcasts i'm just being honest so i don't know what many of the ladies have said but mine is is very twofold there are two elements to the mission that god has given me okay so when did you first when did you start in your in your uh, church side so i'm going like that when did no. you start, when did you start preaching in terms of your church side Min ministry side yeah yeah, so I started preaching again at Bishop Wayne Malcolm. He was, he is, continues to be my favourite by all, by all, all means. Um, when I was about 23, I had to. Bishop was doing a course called Ministers of the Millennial. So I think it may have been around about just before we hit 2000. Yeah, um, like 97, 97, 98, and we had to trained to become what were called um, exalters at the time, exalters, yeah? So trainee ministers. But you had to prepare a 20 minute message based on your own research, all the tools that he taught you. So my very first message that I ever preached as a young lady was called From Rags to Riches. And it was based on the story of Queen Esther and her journey from orphan to queen that's when I started preaching. Okay, so when I was going to CLC, sorry I'm bringing that in. in no, go ahead. CLC, 
I don't. I, I recall seeing you. I recall seeing you with uh, your, your former hubby, your parents, mm-hmm. your, your mm-hmm. father, etc. But I don't recall you preaching. I recall you coming to the fore when I had actually left um, CLC by then. But you might have been preaching by then. So just kind of tell me when you kind of when Karen Allen started to be the name on people's <laughs> lips. And and I remember seeing you. I know that you really greatly admired Jacqueline Peart. So I remember. Yeah. Yes. events where Jackie was preaching but when did it when did it turn that it was like oh my god Karen's preaching I've got to go and hear her oh my god I got a book Karen and I booked her about three times to speak at my event oh my god I got a book Karen when did, when did, why are you laughing because I'm wondering when that happened myself I'm like oh wait my. when did that happen no but you know what I mean it kind of like I do I do I'll I, I tell you based on you know in terms of so I understand what you mean when you said that when you were at CLC, because I was more admin, I was more background. I wasn't I wasn't really upfront, to be honest, when I was at CLC. Bishop would use me on occasion, maybe to do a Bible study, or we used to have three services at one point, and I used to do the early, early morning service, which oh, okay. people usually didn't go to. Okay. So <laughs> in that case, I understand fully why you said you wouldn't have seen me up front, because I really wasn't. And I was happy not being. So I was the administrator behind the scenes. Like I helped to keep the cog going, as you said. Very, very important um, role for those administrators that are watching this podcast. Um, I would say, to be honest with you, this is mad, but the whole Karen Allen scenario happened when I went through the transition of um, no, no, let me go back a bit. No, yes, that is the truth. So when I my husband left, I would say that there was a, a shift in the amount of requests that I was getting to speak, the types of places that I was um, being asked to speak. It was it was a weird shift. So that was 2015. However, let me back up a bit because you mentioned Jacqueline Pierre. In 2008, I launched my own ministry, which was which was under the place of dreams. And I used to do an event called Dare to Dream. I'm sure that you remember Dare to Dream. So Dare to Dream was the the woman's empowerment event. And that really, the heart of Dare to Dream was to give women a place and a platform where they could showcase who they, they could first of all discover their own dreams and showcase them, right? So that was launched in 2008. But, and I did that for seven years. But even so, Dare to Dream was a very hidden event. It was, there was a lot of people that I meet now that are like, I've never ever heard of that. I've never heard of it. Because again, I think that was a huge part of my development and training. And I, and I can honestly say, I don't think people knew me as Karen Allen in that season because it was Len and I in that season. So when, 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 my, hus- when my ex-husband left, and I was literally raising these kids, that's when, a, for want of a better analogy, a blossoming took place where people started to say, wait a minute, who's this Karen Allen? Have you heard of Karen Allen? You should get Karen Allen to speak. That was around about 2015. Because I remember, I think the very first time that you spoke at um, my breakfast, DTS, I can't remember the year, sorry for you, but I know no you were on holiday in hotel and that was after, you know, I remember. your marriage had ended. Yes. And what was amazing was that when you finished, so I'm getting all excited, you know, I get excited <laughs> when I talk to people, but when you finished, you got a standing ovation because I think the message was about how to... Sticks and stones and broken bones. Was I was yeah, it was about pushing on where in that's your right when you correct. experienced personal personal trauma. Trauma, and that's the cool. way that you delivered that and the way that you actually turned what could be a negative thing into something positive was really empowering. Yeah, God is good. People got up to go uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> um standing ovation, but it wasn't even that, it was just about it was an embodiment of how, in spite of everything, yeah. women could still press on. Yes. Whatever it is that God has called them to do. Yes. Live their, live their, live out their mission. Best life. Live yes. out their mission. Now, yeah. that experience of having been left to raise your five uh, children on your own mm. has obviously been transformative. It has yeah. been painful. Yes. Tell 
somehow it's fueled your mission. Can yes. you just kind of just unpack that for us? There's a lot yes. of people who experience tra- something traumatic like that and it knocks them out. Yeah. Well, and good. this is this is this is one of my favorite subjects to talk about. How God uses the broken pieces of our lives and turns it into something absolutely spectacularly beautiful because this is what he has done with me and trauma is something as you said that usually stops most people I remember when I first started to see my counsellor probably a year after uh, my ex-husband left she said to me because it wasn't only that he left I was pregnant when he left with my fifth um, child I was technically homeless because I was living in one room with the kids at my mum's house I had to literally go into temporary accommodation so I had to move home so there was a lot of things happening at the same time and when I went to see the counsellor she said all with all that you're going through she was like most people break down with just one of them things and I remember she gave me a list she said these are the most seven traumatic things that people can go through it was like death divorce moving home you know having a new baby blah 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 and I ticked five things on the seven lists at that time so it wasn't just that one incident of oh he left it was everything else that was going on but Marcia and I tell this story all the time in the midst of it I was six months pregnant and I had said to God talk about having strops with God yeah I told God do not ask me to do nothing because I'm not doing it, yeah? There are other people out here who ain't even got one kid and they ain't doing nothing. So you try and knock on someone else's door and ask them to do it because I ain't doing it. This is how it's going on with our heavenly father who created heaven and the earth, yeah? Bad attitude. Anyway, God said to me as clear as day, you will not allow your brokenness to stop you from pursuing my purpose. He did not give me a group hug. He didn't rub my back. There was no tone of grace in his statement he was very very firm with me but I felt in my spirit like there is a grace it's almost like he was saying there is a grace that I'm going to give you that is going to confound the enemy and what a lot of believers don't understand is that trauma tragedy heartache and pain it is all for the glory of God depending on how we allow ourselves to respond to it and my heartbeat, Marcia, my, at the core of who Karen Allen is, it is to give God the glory. Yeah, I don't care about followers. I don't care about likes. I don't care if they don't like, subscribe, nothing. I just want to know, did God get glory out of what I just did? Did he get glory out of what I just said? Is he getting glory out of these kids that I'm raising? Let me give you a testimony. Yesterday, my eldest son who's 18 got a job. Right, he applied for, he's been applying for all these jobs, I know, right, they got the jobs. He been, he's been applying for all these jobs, he wants to take a year out, he finished his um, two years, finished college now, got a distinction plus, phenomenal young man. Then he asked me, he said, mum, I want to, I said, what's happening with uni? Mum, I just want to take a year out, no problem, the deal is you find a job. He's been applying for jobs since May. Yesterday he got a job. The, one of the ladies that interviewed him at the job knows me. She knows Karen Allen. So she called my phone because it's literally the day that he got the interview, his phone broke. So she wasn't able to get hold of him. She called me, she said, Karen, I'm trying to get hold of your son. I've sent him an email, blah, blah, blah. So I, I checked in with him. Then I called her back. I said, oh, he's got your email. He got the job. I'm excited. She said, that's not the reason I called you. She said, I needed to call you to tell you that your son was extraordinary on that interview. She said, me and my colleague were so blown away by his poise, his respect, the way he answered the questions, his intellect. She went in, like literally she went into one about my son. And she was like, I couldn't let it pass without calling you. And she said, I didn't tell my colleague who he was or that I knew you, but afterwards my colleague was so moved that we were both saying, this guy is 18. We have never met an 18 year old like this. This is what she called me to tell me yesterday. This is God getting the glory. I could have lost my mind when his dad left. I could have chosen to be bitter and twisted and I hate men and what's the point? I could have chosen all of that, most people do. But I decided 
How is God going to get the glory? And the only way God gets glory is if we do it God's way, which is what? It is forgiveness. It's surrender. It's doing what we don't want to do, although God has called us to do it. It's when I said, I'm not preaching again. And God said, yes, you will. And then I say, okay, I surrender. I'll do it. So in answer to your question, because this is one of my favorite things to talk about. Okay. It is, <laughs> it is, how did I? I did by surrendering to what God has asked me to do. And that's how everyone can do. It's literally a decision to surrender. It's a decision to say, not my will. Not my will. You think I wanted to be up front in front of people still preaching. I did not want to do that. But it's not about me. It's not about me and what makes me feel good. You think I didn't want to cuss out them lots, Dad? I am a speaker. I am an eloquent speaker. I know how to cuss. And when God says you shut your mouth, I get to choose. Am I going to cuss him out anyway or am I going to shut my mouth? And in shutting my mouth, I get phone calls like yesterday saying, your son, your, because I made a decision. I said, I will honor their father regardless how I feel. I made that, that decision because God said to me, that's my son. Mm. So I could go on, Mark. Yeah, sometimes we forget that. I mean, what I, what I do recall is that during that time, you held, you held teaching sessions about, you know, you travelled to Birmingham, you most probably travelled to other places, you most probably did things on Facebook Live or whatever, you was using social media a lot, just talking talking about, your, not so much talking about your experience, but using the word to say to other women, you can get through this, God can take yeah. you through whatever trauma you've experienced. So yeah. my next question for you is, how did do how was doing that a support to the women who attended those sessions it was seriously it was revolutionary you mentioned birmingham i was someone reached out to me on social media um because they had followed my I, I was doing a whole load of bible studies during that but the reason a lot of people don't know this the reason i was doing the bible studies was because i was getting healed while i was doing the bible studies so it was almost like my antidote to the pain that i was feeling i chose the word so instead of just literally keeping it to myself, I, sh I broke bread with others. So I was doing a lot of Bible studies. Um, a lady reached out to me, asked me to come up to Birmingham. And I did. I was doing a Bible study series called Broken into Useful Pieces based on my book at the time. And in going to Birmingham, I'm just using that as an example, and watching these women come out on a Saturday morning for us literally to break bread, to break the word down and for me to not... Be and one of the things God said to me, He asked me, God, they got Mars, you know what we were talking about beforehand. I know God speaks to people because He speaks to me, and He asked me, right? He said to me, Will you allow me to use your life as a testimony? He said that to me. So, there are people who have asked me along the way, Why do you share so openly? Because God asked me, He asked me if He could use my life, and I said, Okay, you can use my life. So, it wasn't just about me sharing the word, which is profound and powerful and i will never do without but it was about me using my example of look this is what i'm going through and one of the things women used to ask me at the end of every session the one woman would someone in the room would put up their hand and say can i ask you a question yeah so how are things with you and your husband now i would always get asked that question and i would say i am still in the middle of that story I am still in the middle of that. I've not come through. I'm not out the other end. The fire is still around me. I'm just not being burnt by it. Women were, they were confounded. I'm telling you the truth. Like they couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. And those who got it were able to then apply it to their own lives and their own situation. Now that's good because we know that um, as women, sometimes our output, whether in terms of work, ministry <clears throat> just our general life gets affected by our relationships yeah. yes yes um, men our husbands our partners the fathers of our children so it's good to hear that in spite of the issues that can arise out of male female relationships that you still felt it felt god say to you to um, press on move forward so yeah Going to the next question, what whole, what role, what whole, what role has prayer, faith, and scripture played in the development and growth of your ministry, particularly in the, these these last maybe five six years? Because you've already how 
in your early years you were in, embedded in the life of the church so you yes. were surrounded by that but in this this season or this last six five five six years how was how was how have all those three things helped you it it has been my lifeline now i don't want anyone to take this lightly what i'm saying about lifeline if we just talk about the pandemic i have the god has has graced me to be able to minister to a lot of people during the pandemic what i have found is that there are a lot of believers who have turned to alternative vices during the pandemic so people have started doing things or or restarted doing things that they stopped doing years ago because of the pressure of the pandemic now i understand that on a logical level however for me and this was pre-pandemic so because i had already had a strategy pre-pandemic i just kept that going throughout the pandemic prayer the word fasting these things are my vices to the point where i began to think it was a problem i began to think karen you can't just quote the bible you can't because people i would quote the bible to people believers and they would say to me karen this is real life i'm dealing with here or they would say karen you've got to be realistic and i would be like yo this is how you're asking me how i i'm telling you how i then you're telling me that i've got to be realistic this is my realistic this is my realism my realism is prayer it's the word it's fasting and i want to add a few things to that it's walking i journal i write and now i've added water and working out to that so I, i have a strategy for how i overcome or get through and walk through painful dark dark seasons but at the top of that list it is talking to god it is reading his word and it is worship so by god's grace and i don't say this lightly by his grace alone i have not had to pick up uh, the weed i have, do not smoke i do not have to drink a whole bottle of rosé before i go to bed but that's only because it's, what i push pull for is for the bible on audio on my phone or i'll put on preaching that will send me straight to sleep that's me i'm good those things have been come in i would not marcia i'm telling you now my kids would be in care or with another family member and i would be rocking in an institute somewhere with a white tied vest if it was not for those spiritual tools that god has given me I mean, 100% i mean we, you have i mean you you chronicle your journey on social media you've been through a lot you yes experienced the passing of your brother yes so recently your mother had a stroke a so stroke, to be yes. honest it is a miracle that i'm here yes. talking to you yes you're in your right mind yeah you're ecstatic that your son who of course would be affected by what affects you right has been described as an exceptional extraordinary young man and you're still mind getting preaching engagements and you're right <laughs> so these are the major challenges and you've just shared that you've overcome them through prayer fasting and the word so yes. you've been in ministry a long time what's kept you going and what do you enjoy most about it yeah what's kept me going is is and I, I just need, need to tag on to something that i just said prayer fasting the word and an amazing village okay that's that's something okay. especially to women i've got to say to women you've got to have good women around you yeah non-negotiable so i need to, to say that um, but in terms of what's kept me going, it really is. I met up with a friend recently and um, she was just like, you know, you're just so amazing. And I'm kind of rolling my eyes. And she was like, you know, how do you do it? And I said, you know what? One of my key things is, is, I said, as much as you love me, right? I said to her, if I needed a favor today and it was in your power, your capacity to help me, would you help me? She was like, yeah, anything, anything I can do for you, Karen, anything I could do for you. I was like, why? because I love you blah 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 I said that's how I feel about God I feel like if there's anything in my power that I can do for God if God asks me and I can do it I'm going to do it because God has been good to me God has been faithful to me he has been kind to me he has kept me so when you say what keeps me going 
It is how good God has been to me. This is why giving up is not an option. Like cursing God and dying, this is not an option. You know, wiling out and acting like a crazy woman. These things are not options. Well, they're sometimes options, but I don't choose them because God has been good to me. You know, the Bible says that Abraham was a friend of God. This is how I feel. When I go on my walks, I talk to God on a level. So when God taps me, usually around three o'clock in the morning, three, four o'clock, and he's like, Karen, this is what I want you to do. I, as much, there'll be times when I do wrestle and I'll be like, God, why can't you ask? But ultimately I'll be like, but you've been so good. And because you've been so good, I'm going to do this for you. That, that Marcia is at the core of what keeps me going, how good God has been. And what I enjoy most about it is turning people onto him, whether it be through the word, like there are so many testimonies I have of people who have come through my Bible studies, who started reading the Bible because they came through my Bible studies, despite being in church for 10, 15, 20 years. There was something about the way I delivered, I shared my story that caused them to say, now I read the Bible. Even recently someone said, now they teach Bible studies because they came to my Bible study. Those things are the highlights of my 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 life, my being. That something about what God has done in me that I was obedient to do has now turned you on to him in some capacity, second to none. Well, what you just said segues perfectly into my next question, which is mm. that you've served and ministered to a lot of people over the years. So yes. can you give a few examples, aside from the um, people who now teach Bible <laughs> attending your Bible class, just give a few examples of people's lives that have been really impacted and transformed by your ministry. Oh, goodness gracious. So this week, I someone sent me a picture of themselves and someone else. So they were at an event and they obviously they met each other at this event. Then they got talking about churches they used to go, blah, 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 blah. Then my name came up. There was like, oh, it's one of them. I said, oh, and then there's this lady named Karen Allen. The person was like, you know Karen Allen? They were like, yeah, Karen Allen. So then she called me in the night. So she sent me the picture and then she called me in the night. She was like, oh, I couldn't believe that she knew you. Now this person that I'm speaking of, she is now in her mid thirties. She is a homeschooling mother of four, um, wife, mother of four, business entrepreneur. I used to run a ministry called Pearls in my twenties, right? So when I was in my twenties, she would have been 10, 11, 12, maybe. But because of the, and she said it, she said that she said this to the person, Karen Allen was the person who mentored me when I was a preteen and throughout my life, I, she said throughout her life, my ministry has been so key. Cause I don't know if you remember Marcia, I used to homeschool my kids. Yeah, I so do. I, remember before... inter- I remember interviewing you, Karen. <laughs> there you go. Keep the voice and keep the face. So... <laughs> Come on girl. So now she's got four kids of her own that she homeschools, but there's been so many points in my life and ministry that she was able to glean from because of my life and ministry that now has played out in her life. That blew me away just this week because there was things she was reminding me of that I didn't even remember. I was like, oh my gosh, I forgot that, oh my gosh. I forgot that. That's just one example that came off the top of my head. I think another example is one day I was preaching at a, um, a church in Kent. And um, I didn't really, it was one of them moods where I don't really want to preach, but I'd prepared, etc. And I think my message was called Generation X. And I I didn't want to do it, but it was one of them moments where I knew God was like, Karen, just do me a favour, just, and I was like, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it. After the service, I'll never forget this, is why I'm giving it as an example. The guy, there's a guy, everyone was, you know, hi, your message was powerful when people were slowly going. And there was this one guy sitting on the front row, just in the corner. So I'm just greeting people. Now the place is almost empty. So then he comes up to me and he says, can I have a word with you, please? I said, yeah. And he start. he literally just, just staring at me. I'm like, is everything okay? And he was like, yeah, I just, I'm just, just trying to get myself together. And then he said, you know what? He said, I came here today because I said to God, if you don't speak to me, I'm not going back home. I'm going to commit suicide. He was like, today, 
I actually, I made a decision and he was married with kids. And he said he made a decision that he's not going to go through with it because too much. And he started talking about what's going on. And then he said he had never heard anyone preach the way that I preached and delivered the way that I delivered. But because of that, he has decided that he can keep going. And in that moment, there were moments like that that have happened to me that I'm like, this is why I can't disobey God because I don't know. I have no clue. And that guy has kept in contact with me. This was probably three years ago now. And every month, roughly, uh, on average, I've got a, um, a broadcast of men that I just send a word of encouragement to. And I'll just literally just speak into their life. And he's on the broadcast. And he's probably one of a few that always responds like, I will never forget you. Thank you for continuing to speak into my life. Thank you for not forgetting me. Those are just two examples of many that I could give you, Mars. And those are individuals. I think the great thing when I hear stories like that, and I have stories like that from my work at The Voice or whatever, is that it's a reminder that when you do work for God or when you speak on God's behalf, if we can speak on God's behalf. We can, we use, can. When God to uses speak, us yeah. to speak, his word is so powerful, powerful. and transformative mm. and turn, changes people's lives. Yes. And that's why I love preaching ministry, teaching ministry. I love preachers. I think they're the best speakers in the <laughs> world. Some motivational speakers. but I, I agree with you. I agree. Because the word of life that is in mm. their mouth is just amazing transformative powerful life changing just yes. amazing just yes amazing. so it's great to hear that story and to i agree hear that it can turn somebody from even even who's thinking about ending it all when yeah. they have everything yeah. to live for powerful. yes very very yeah. powerful and that's why god obviously is saying daughter Mm. I may try to knock you down, but I need you to be standing and yeah. speaking. So that yeah. that is just really, really um, powerful. That's just really, really powerful. And to also know that you, you as a um, t- a role model for a young preteen, that they yeah. remember the example that you yeah. see. And at yeah. various points in their life, Karen c- comes up in their mind or... <laughs> Their, her ministry touches their life and it and it impacts them. Very, very powerful. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, because you speak to lots of women, that there's yes. many women who feel called to ministry or who actually run a ministry. What yes. three pieces of advice do you have for them? <sighs> I thought about this because obviously you had sent me the questions and there were so many things I was going to say, then I thought, no. Because one of the things I've promised God is that I, if I ever speak, I'm going to say what I want to say if it's the last time people ever hear me speak, okay? So there's many things that I could say, but I'm going to leave that to your other guests, okay? And I'm going to say these three things. Number one, ministry, any ministry that you're called to, it is going to be a process. And the reason why I want women to understand this is because I don't want them to start the ministry thinking that they're going to go from zero to hero in a minute because that's not how ministry works. It is a process. It takes time. I want you to think of, for those who have had kids, I want you to think of being pregnant, not having the baby, being pregnant. For those who haven't had kids and you've ever baked a cake, I want you to think of the process of the cake being in the oven. (laughs) Yeah? I don't want you to think, I don't want you, right, I don't want you to think of eating the cake. I want you to think of the oven bit, okay? That's the process, yeah? And the reason I'm saying that is because we live in such a fast paced world, everything's now, that that kingdom don't work like the world, that is counter the culture. You're going to have to, you cannot avoid the process because it's in the process that you become who God has ordained you to be. So God showed me myself speaking on platforms when I didn't even speak. But it it never went from him showing me to me speaking on platforms. It went from him showing me to me being people chatting to me, chatting me behind my back, then me doing a little exhortation to people wanting to cuss me out. Then this is how it goes. It's back and forth. It's up and down. It's in and out. And it's a process. That's the first thing I need every woman to know. The second thing I want every woman to know is it is going to be painful. And I'm just going to give you a minute to let that sink in. 
Because what people forget is the pain that takes place when the baby comes out of the of the womb to the world. Yeah. There is a very painful process. And the cake, if the cake could talk, the cake would have told you it was hot in there. It was very hot in there. Yeah. I didn't appreciate being in the oven for that long because it was hot. But when the cake comes out when the baby comes out what we get is something beautiful there is going to be elements seasons times of excruciating pain especially if you're called to worldwide ministry okay don't look at worldwide ministry and desire it don't because it's the pain that comes with that yeah i'm a living witness the pain that comes with ministry is no joke but what comes out on the other side again is no joke it is absolutely gloriously beautiful but i need women to know if no one else is telling you it's painful karen allen's telling you right now i'm talking about pain on levels that that blow when i think about it now i'm like only grace only grace so i want women to know it's a process i want women to know it's going to be painful saying yes to the call of god is going to cause you pain okay third thing i want women to know it is not about you Mid them, whatever ministry you're called to is not about you, it is about the people. You see what I've done there? I've used my three P's because that's what I do. So it's about the process, the pain, and the people. And why I'm saying the people is because there are going to be times when you want to give up, there are going to be times when you're like, This is enough. There's going to be times when you're going to be like, So, where is all the help? Where's all the finances? Where's what you showed me, God? I thought you said that all of that's going to happen. And what's gonna have to bring you back to getting up and doing it again is this is not about me. This, Karen Allen, what I do, what I am doing, it's not about me. And I don't know who your people are. Again, my people include a lot of people, starting with my five kids. Then I've got my extended family. Then I've actually got the ministry people that I have to minister to. Whatever God's called you to do, it, it will only, if you take the focus off of people and put it onto yourself, then you've missed what God has called you to do. Do not ever forget that what you are called to do is about the people that you are called to do it for. Those are the three pieces of advice I would give. So that's the pain, the process, and the people. And the people, okay. yeah. Very succinct there. <laughs> Preaching, the three people. <laughs> they can't help it. Preachers can't help it, you know. <laughs> you know you're asking a question. They've got to be preaching. And then take long. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. Hi, lad. <laughs> right, this is the last question. Okay. Um, last but not least, what exciting plans do you have for your ministry in the next few months? Um you say exciting plans. I do I do have a plan, but I don't know if it will play out in the next few months. Because in this season, as you mentioned, that my mum had a, a very severe severe stroke at the beginning of 2021. And I have been so, like, Marcia, this is the, the first, what well, well, I'd say, ministry interview that I've done in 2021, because I've really been under the radar for, for more reasons than could ever even be described. Um, however, prior to, so in 2020, the Lord really put on my heart another element of my mission, which is to speak life and love into the, the hearts of black men in particular. And I had an event just before the pandemic hit in February 2020 then I wrote a book called Thou Art The Man and then like I said I've had these group of men that I've just been speaking into their lives and one of the things that I have planned is to do on a, a, a much larger scale the event that we did pre-pandemic which is really an event that um, provides a safe space for men and where men are celebrated and supported for the work that they do in their families and in their communities. And one of the things that I'm working on with a team is really to collaborate with women who have a similar heart of my, as mine, which is really to honor and highlight black men in particular, those who are doing great work, like I said, in the community, but also I believe with my whole heart that bl us black women have a huge part to play in healing the hearts of black men and i say that this would be a whole different podcast of podcast by the way but i say that because of what i have seen just in the past 18 months in being intentional with doing that myself and god granting me the grace and the space to have conversations with men that have blown my mind 
So one of the things that I want to do is create a space. Um, all I, I, it would it would almost be a dare to dream spin off for men, where they are literally they come into this space and from the moment that they enter until the moment they leave, all they feel is love, celebration, and honor from us. This is one of the things that I have um, in the pipeline. Okay, that sounds that sounds really really good. One of one of uh, my prayers or my concerns has been is the kind of uh, gulf there seems to be between black men and black women and the i'm just talking culturally now not to yes. speak with me personally and the screaming matches there are with with men being accused of being doing certain things or being certain being a certain way and often in that discussion they have not really responded and it's good to know that you're providing a platform where I'm supposing that they share, but also where they can be celebrated because um, in recent years, particularly because of the rise in knife crime and stuff like that, we are recognizing as a community how valuable men are. They are the backbone. So it's yeah. good that you feel, feel it necessary that we honor and respect them. Cause I think we have to, we can't, yeah. women can't do it by themselves men can't do it by themselves absolutely we need it, to it come together too much, too much. respect and honor each other so props to you for yeah. actually doing that and aren't you involved in the opening of uh, some boxing center yeah so as you mentioned again earlier my brother who passed away <clears throat> in 2018 um suddenly and unexpectedly of meningitis he um just before he passed away like in the june of that year he had a vision and a dream to use boxing to engage young people who were disengaged or disaffected, disadvantaged. And we had an event at Alexandra Palace, a phenomenal revolutionary event, where he collided the world of professional boxing with young people who wouldn't be exposed to, to such a thing. Um, one of the things that he wanted to do was open a boxing club that would allow young people to channel their energies, for want of a better phrase, into boxing and literally not just the practice of boxing, but also the personal development elements of what it takes to be a good boxer and the metaphor of what boxing means for life. So the, then he passed away in the November, but he was in talks with a friend of ours about the boxing club and then I think probably four to six months after he passed, an opportunity arose for us to have a space in a youth club in Ponders End in Enfield. And then during that space, again, just before the pandemic, the youth services were given some money and then they were building a state of the art new youth club. And they said that we could have a space in there to build a boxing gym in honor of my brother, which was launched in July two, three months ago, 2021. So now the Joe Morris Boxing Gym is in Enfield and I am the CEO of that boxing gym. Woo! All good things are happening in spite of everything. Which, and when are you going to be speaking? When are you going to be preaching? <sighs> well, I'm speaking at an event this Saturday. I don't know if I can mention that, but apart from that, I'm... <laughs> apart from that, I'm not... Again, I've not got speaking and preaching lined up in terms of church but i am going to be starting my bible study series but i'm going to do it online now and when i say online on the youtube channel so i'm officially going to stream my bible studies on my youtube channel which my boys have encouraged me to do because i'm in home i'm at home doing bible studies with just myself and the kids and i'm just i've got so much in me and i was like okay mum, there's platforms that you can actually do this on so that's one of the things that I am definitely going to intentionally do. And I'm starting a podcast as well, okay, which I haven't excellent. ever done. Right. It wasn't as bad as you thought it was going to be, was it? I love it, Mars. You know I love you. You know I love talking to you, Mars. It's just, you know, still thank struggling you. with that I whole mean, thing. Thank you for taking time out because you're a busy woman, a mother of, with five children. And she still <laughs> finds time to be a CEO. <laughs> Preach and to run Bible studies, and when Ka Karen does Bible studies, she, she actually studies what she's teaching. Oh yes, skim things. So I want to celebrate you. I want to salute you. you. I want to uh, thank, thank you. God for your gift, and mm. thank you for sharing so honestly. I really hope if you're watching this that you are blessed and encouraged and inspired mm. and empowered by what Karen Allen has shared. Thank you. Thank you, Mars. Mwah. Bless you all.